poverty rates would be reduced by 16%. Six zero or one six? One six. Which is an incredible number uh, because there are a lot of people living at the edge of poverty. So for us, uh, this will be the beginning, hopefully the beginning of an interesting conversation so that we can be in a position to address concerns in Congress or concerns around the society so we can figure out what are the legal, political, constitutional debates. Uh, in this panel, hopefully, and I have no doubt about it, will sort of be part of this sort of introductory conversation uh, that I think can help us at least understand some of the political, constitutional, legal parameters uh, around this question. As a starting point, we have agreed that this can be a larger conversation. Um, I have, we have negotiated times here, but I said I was going to be flexible with that. We were originally asked to give everybody five minutes, but I said, you know, take ten or whatever you need, uh, and then we'll have a conversation. Dangerous. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. Uh, and especially with, with intelligent people. Uh, you know, when you have, when you have <laughs> folk and make intelligent arguments. So, so let, let me begin by introducing Cristina Dolphy Ponce, uh, who has written some of the most interesting work uh, recently, uh, recently, but in law reviews, but her classic work, Foreign and the Domestic Sense, yeah, has edited a volume and written some really interesting, uh, and she's a professor at Columbia Law University. Um, Professor Efrén Rivera Ramos, uh, who's a professor at the University of Puerto Rico, who's also written some interesting in, uh, seminal work on the insular cases and other stuff. As a matter of fact, I began reading Efrén Rivera Ramos almost 30 years ago when my, oh. uncle, <laughs> when my, when my, my <laughs> uncle, a famous judge, gave me an article that had published on civil disobedience a long time ago on the military <laughs> raid. Anyway. So he's been around doing some really interesting work for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Rafael Cox Alomar, uh, who is a professor at the DC University District of Columbia Law School, uh, who's also been a political candidate, uh, but we're going to emphasize his academic credentials. Uh, and the three of them provide a wealth of information from a wealth of uh, political perspectives and from a variety of political perspectives. So again, the goal is to give you an introduction to some of the key debates, constitutional debates, political debates, legal debates, that may inform any kind of conversation. Uh, but I'll let them speak. I don't want to speak for them uh, because they have lots of interesting comments to make from different political perspectives. Um, I will hold on to questions to the end. The one thing that I really want to emphasize is that we want to have a productive conversation. I don't need any additional panelists. So if you have a question, <laughs> Please, please feel free to ask it. If you want to make a comment, please give space to others who want to ask questions, and then we'll leave uh, comments to the end. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to be mindful of time and yeah. mindful of uh, our great panel. So uh, please, let me begin with Christina Okay, so um, I'm, uh, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, very pleased to be here, and I feel like I have to emphasize that because the things I'm going to say might sound like I'm not at all pleased to be here. <laughs> because, I mean, here in the existential sense, definitely not. But this is a conversation, you know, it could be a larger conversation, as Charles said. It could also be a small conversation. So I, you know, my, my priors, <coughs> I've been on many panels where I talk about status and, you know, the constitutional dimensions of all the different options and so on. Um, but, but, but my bottom line is that I'm for statehood. And I am so tired of us fine-tuning our subordination. I do, you know, just, oh, I'm tired. But I'm always up for a good conversation. <laughs> so I just wanted to confess to start. And I, you know, I'm here to be challenged. OK, so I, you know, so th this is the status panel. Um, and so I feel like, you know, when we turn to status, it feels like we're trapped in an eternal founding you know, like the founding era of the United States? Well, our founding never ends. Who are we gonna be? What's our true identity? Are we American or are we Puerto Rican or are we both or can you be both? So, you know, that's the conversation we're having. Puerto Rico faces immediate and urgent problems and nothing I say about status should imply that I think that's the only thing we should focus on, nor should it imply that I think statehood or any other status would solve all our problems. I do not believe that. But since we're focusing on status, which is what I'm most competent to talk about, um, that's what I'm uh, gonna focus on. So, um, 
we were we were actually so we, we were asked we had a was a fascinating round of emails even before coming here about exactly what we were supposed to talk about and um, as I understood our charge it's to talk about the question of uh, the possibilities for parity of funding under the current status and under other status options um, the uh, under the current status under any status under the current let's start with the current status there are legal arguments and there are moral arguments for parity with parity meaning parity with the states so that we've got we've got our baseline the states they get what one should be getting uh, and we don't and how can we achieve the parity that we should have the legal arguments uh, are uh, the legal arguments are being developed and litigated by Professor Rivera Ramos and a group of other people in an actual case that's moving its way through the court. So I feel almost like I'm overstepping my bounds. If I get into it too much, I don't even talk about that. Okay, so there, I mean, there are some Supreme Court cases that say it's okay for the United States not to give Puerto Rico uh, uh, equal uh, funding for social welfare. Uh, cases from the 80s in particular that say uh, just the most outrageous, ridiculous things about how okay it is for us to have less funding. I'm gonna let you talk. Okay. Um, you know, and the, 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 the basis of those cases is Puerto Rico is a territory, not a state, and Congress can treat territories differently. Um, and it's true, Congress has ter treated territories differently forever, but there are arguments to be made with respect to social welfare programs that uh, I think are quite compelling legal arguments. Um, the arguments on the other side, though, are also strong, although I think the Supreme Court was really dismissive in the 80s in a way it shouldn't have been. So I can say more about that in Q&A if, if he ends up talking about something else. Okay. Um, <laughs> the moral arguments, okay, so this is where like, it gets more tortured for me because the moral arguments are entwined with legal arguments, but what are they? You know, we, we are part of this what? country or what, what it, polity, you know? You, you have a responsibility for us because we are what? We are citizens, we are here, we are subject to you. You should fulfill your duties with respect to us as people and citizens. Um, and from the US, there has been degrees of this for sure. Uh, Trump is the worst offender in so many ways, and he's a bad offender on this too, but he is not alone. An attitude of us and them, okay? You all are not really us, you're something different. Uh, and the way he talks about how you know, we've done enough for them, and what more they want from us, you know, that kind of thing. So that attitude is offensive, and at the same time, I struggle with the fact that the United States is, you know, they used to get that, you know, 100 years ago, that was the imperialists, but for a long time since then, they've been getting that message from us. Uh, not all of us, but from those of us who, you know, think we're different, we can't really be a part of this. It's really hard to find purchase for that moral argument if you're at the same time, you know, you don't want to be a part of this. For me, I, I struggle with that, okay? Other people can reconcile it, I can't. As, uh, uh, I, I have difficulty, I don't know, which is the chicken and which is the egg. That's hard for me to reconcile because I'm a statehooder or I'm a statehooder because I have difficulty reconciling that. I'm certainly not a statehooder because I'm pro-American. I'm not, I, I'm not nationalist in any direction, it's not me. I just believe that we ought to have the equality that everybody should have, that's it, and that's why I think we want to get parity from statehood. So the, the legal arguments, you know, we, I can say more if you want. The moral arguments, I think we're undermining ourselves. Um, uh, and uh, those two <coughs> approaches are difficult to disentangle. Uh, if the, let me, let me see how else I want to make this point. Okay, so if the legal arguments for parity were to prevail, something I would like to see with or without statehood, there's still 
the question of, you know, what happens in the next Congress. Okay, so that, that, that the question of what we can achieve under the current status is always a question of what we can actually get and then whether we can keep it. Okay, so what can the content of a current arrangement be and then what happens in the future? And with the current arrangement, Congress certainly has the power, the, the obstacles to Congress giving us parity of funding isn't lack of power. They could give us funding, they could give us parity of funding, they could give us more funding. There's nothing stopping Congress from giving us funding. There are actually constraints on Congress giving us equal representation uh, uh, in, the, in, in Congress that don't apply for funding. Congress can do whatever it wants. The, the real, so, so, so the obstacle is to get it, and then the risk is that then the next Congress takes it away. And that's a problem with respect to the, the in-between status, you know, not statehood, not independence, always. There's plenty we could have in terms of autonomy and power and funding and what have you, but we would always be at the mercy of Congress. And so my, my resistance and objection to the in-between statuses is always that. I don't have a problem necessarily, well, I don't have a problem with parity of funding at all. I don't have a problem with greater <coughs> autonomy. I do think that if we want to be treated equally, then we might as well just get the autonomy that statehood gives you. Statehood is, you know, the form of autonomy that exists in the system. Let's take it. Let's take it. It's ours to take. Uh, but if we have something other than that, then next year, the year after that, who gets elected president, who's the majority in Congress, we're at their mercy because they always have the power to say, forget it. I take it back. Um, I, I expect maybe my colleagues will talk about free associated statehood. Uh, I think that's a problem with free associated statehood. I don't think that, that so free associated statehood, which, which involves a, a sort of an arrangement between two sovereigns, Puerto Rico would be one, the US would be the other, you know, sovereigns always have the prerogative to, to go their own way. Uh, so our being dependent on the United States wanting to maintain that kind of relationship, I don't, wanna, I don't want Puerto Rico to be trapped there. Um, so finally, what I wanna say is, that parity of funding is critical and urgent and essential, but full empowerment is also critical and urgent and essential and would get us parity of funding. Uh, it would also, and this maybe resonates a little bit, well this is, you know, would, statehood wouldn't solve corruption either, statehood wouldn't solve all problems, but statehood would also distribute power on the island locally in a way that I think would be healthy for local politics. That is, in Puerto Rico, the governor has such power, mm -hmm. recent events included, I mean, you know, aside, whatever, you know, so what happened, what happened with this governor, you know, it was a glorious thing to see people say enough and he's gone. But structurally speaking, there's this one person who's at the pinnacle locally and who's the conduit with his collaborating non-voting resident commissioner who has no leverage, but at least is in DC, but no leverage. These two people together, okay, that governor has too much power. Whereas you have a governor and two senators and several representatives and then there's a diffusion of that power. There are people connected to the place that has so much power over us. Uh, who can be responsive to their constituents without it all being always siphoned through the governor. So, you know, so I could maybe go on about that too, but I won't because I probably, I'm sure I've exceeded my, my time and my emotional quotient. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I'm just, I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, I'm gonna leave it at that. The, the end. <laughs> Professor Rivera Ramos. Okay, so um, thank you. I'd like to thank the uh, Center for inviting me to, to this summit. And I'm really very pleased to be sharing this panel with these very good friends. I've been in panels with <coughs> three of them before. <laughs> and we've always talked about survived. basically everything we have, we have survived, yeah. Um, now, as, um, um, as Charles uh, mentioned, the uh, the task that we were given was to examine the, the, the unequal treatment of Puerto Rico in the extension of federal social benefits to its population. 
looking at that through the lens of the political status question. Um, and uh, especially to explore, as uh, Christina said, the possibilities of achieving parity in these programs under different political status alternatives. That's, that was our task, right? And I will certainly address that. However, I would like to begin with a couple of caveats. Uh, can you listen to me? Can you hear me? Not very bad. Okay. First, posing the matter exclusively in terms of achieving parity in particular programs, U.S. programs, might be somewhat misleading. Perhaps for reasons related to those expressed by Christina or for other reasons. Uh, for in my view, the main concern should be how can Puerto Ricans attain a sufficient degree of social, economic, and cultural welfare through comprehensive policies and programs in nutrition, health, education, economic development, the environment, culture, and other areas in order to enjoy <coughs> humane, sustainable, and fulfilling living conditions. That's the crucial question in this area. Second, the political status question involves much more than the discriminatory treatment visited on Puerto Rico's residents regarding federal social programs. After all, colonialism, which is the fundamental issue in this regard, touches on practically all aspects of life in the colony. And I think we can agree on that. I, I hope then that the focus on discrimination in social programs, important as it is, will serve only as a point of departure, as, as Charles uh, mentioned, for a broader discussion. <coughs> Having said that, let, let me go to the issue of parity, and um, I, I must say that I will uh, address it mostly in, in legal terms, although I would say something about the political dimension of the, of the problem. Uh, as we know, the U.S. government has completely excluded Puerto Rico from certain social benefits, such as the um, Supplemental Security Income Program, SSI, other programs such as Medicaid, and the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, known as SNAP, are capped at certain levels in Puerto Rico so that its residents do not receive the full benefits they would if they resided in the U.S. or even, in some cases, in other territories. So the first question, is parity possible? And I would underline, legally possible, under the current Commonwealth status. And as Christina, I think, has um, suggested, the short answer is yes, it could be achieved under the Commonwealth status. There are two possibilities with different prospects of viability. One would be through legislation approved by Congress, extending to Puerto Rico the excluded programs, or removing the caps on the existing ones. Of course, this is entirely dependent on the political will of Congress. In fact, by virtue of its plenary powers over the territories, Congress could even create special programs for Puerto Rico or provide for funding in excess of that provided to the states or to other territories. There is no constitutional bar for these types of measures. Whether Congress is or will be willing to take such action is another question. So, and that's the political dimension. In this regard, the key would be the political pressure that could be exerted on uh, its members. One huge difficulty, of course, is the lack of voting representation from Puerto Rico in Congress, as we know. Therefore, uh, this is an area in which the diaspora could play a decisive role. The second possibility within Commonwealth status <coughs> is through the courts, that is, by a strategy founded not on a persuasive appeal for a change in policy effectuated by the uh, political branches, but by a rights-based claim vindicated 
through the judiciary. In fact, as Christina mentioned, there are currently several cases pending at different levels in the federal court system challenging the constitutionality of such discrimination. One is the U.S. v. Vallejo case in which Chief Just Judge Gustavo Helpi of the U.S. Federal Court of the District of Puerto Rico has recently determined that the U.S. government illegally discriminated against Mr. Vallejo by depriving him of SSI benefits when he moved from New York <coughs> to the island. The case is on appeal uh, at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. Another case is Peña Martinez uh, versus Azar, now also pending in the U.S. District Court for Puerto Rico. There, a number of plaintiffs are challenging the exclusion of Puerto Rico from SSI benefits and from the Low Income Subsidy, the LIS program that is part of the Medicare program. They are also challenging the caps placed on the um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or, or SNAP. So those are the challenges uh, <coughs> pending now in court. Now a major difficulty in this litigation is the existing, existence of two U.S. Supreme Court precedents called Califano versus Torres and Harris versus Rosario decided in 1978 and 1980, respectively, which held that by virtue of its plenary powers, you, the U.S. Congress could legislate for the territories in such disparate manner as long as it had a rational basis for its actions. Now, in both cases, the court found that there was a rational basis for what Congress had done, and uh, the court stated that that uh, discriminatory treatment was justified for three basic reasons. One, Puerto Rico residents did not pay federal taxes. Two, extending parity to Puerto Rico would be too expensive for the U.S. taxpayers. And three, parity in funding, I underline this, would disrupt the Puerto Rican economy. <laughs> I, still, I, I, I still cannot figure out what they meant. Um, now, plaintiffs in the Peña Martinez case allege that the different treatment of residents of Puerto Rico constitutes a violation of the Equal Protection Guarantee of the U.S. Constitution. And, among other things, they argue that the three justifications validated by the Supreme Court in Harris and Califano 40 years ago do not hold water anymore, if they ever did. What will the uh, courts eventually do with these cases is frankly very difficult to predict. That's Commonwealth. What are the prospects for parity under other forms of political status? It seems clear that under statehood, Puerto Rico would have to be treated on an equal footing with the other states, and Cristina has emphasized that point very eloquently. There is no question about that. Rather, the question would be, and this is probably on a much longer term basis, <coughs> what kind of social programs would the U.S. maintain or adopt for all the states now or in the future? What statehood guarantees is not the same level of funding that now exists in the U.S., but the same level of funding that the other states receive, whatever that level of funding will be. Question. Will Obamacare survive? Will the nutrition assistance program be reduced or, eliminate or eliminated? What will be the future of federal funding for education, the environment, cultural programs, and the like? Will those programs reflect the type of policies that Puerto Rico needs to meet its aspirations for a more just, free, and sustainable society according to its circumstances? Those, oh, those are important questions, too. As any other country in the world, large or small, rich or poor, the U.S. is subject to its own share of uncertainties, conditioned by such factors as economic crisis, ideological battles, shifts in policy preferences, internal fractures, 
the balance of political and social forces, international developments, and the like. Parity will have to be parity in good and bad times. What are the prospects for parity under a status such as that of a freely associated republic? The answer has to be, well, it depends. And it depends on what? It depends mostly on the terms of the Treaty of Association signed between the United States and Puerto Rico. Such treaty could include provisions regarding the level of funding that Puerto Rico would receive during a period of transition to the new status, as well as a package of longer term economic assistance similar to those in effect for the existing US associated republics such as the Marshall Islands. It is to be remembered, however, that there would be a significant difference between the Associated Republic of Puerto Rico and the currently existing one, ones. And that difference is that many in Puerto Rico would still be US citizens. The economic relevance of such a condition is something that will inevitably have to be explored in more depth. And what about independence? Of course, an independent Puerto Rico would have to develop its own system of social security tied to its economic capacities and its ability to secure resources both internally through the mobilization of its productive forces <coughs> and externally through outside investment, international transactions, regional and global alliances, and foreign aid. It is to be hoped that in such scenario, if it, if it ever came, came to be, Puerto Rico's social security system, this that would be my hope, would be much more progressive than the one now prevalent in the US, including establishing a strong public educational system and a universal health care and prevention program. But much will depend on the political and social forces at work as well. It is also to be expected that the US would be willing to negotiate a transition period that would include fairly decent economic provisions and that eventually, given the close historical, demographic, and economic ties between the two countries, the US will include Puerto Rico in its foreign aid programs and commercial treaties within the framework of its international relations in the region. In this respect, if that were the case, the members of the Puerto Rican diaspora living in the US could be crucial actors as advocates on behalf of their mother country. Moreover, many Puerto Ricans who would still be considered US citizens, and even those who are not, would be eligible to receive their earned US social security benefits while living in Puerto Rico, just like many US citizens living abroad regularly do, regardless of their country of residence. For example, today, many US citizens receive their social security pensions in Europe, in Cuba, in the former Soviet, Soviet Socialist Republics, and in other places around the world. Of course, all of this would be subject to many contingencies, and that has to be granted, as is the case with the other political status alternatives. Being that so, another commonality in all of these scenarios will be the need for Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, in the US, and abroad to come together, organize, establish solidarity networks, strategize, and keep struggling and fighting for more just, participatory, egalitarian, and sustainable social, political, economic, and cultural communities. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's great to be here with you guys. I mean, this is a great panel. Uh, I would like to preface my remarks. I'm just going to go straight to the point and raise a few observations, and then hopefully we'll open it up to 
to your questions and we will engage in a robust conversation. Um, I would like to preface my remarks by emphasizing that this roundtable has come at the perfect timing. Only yesterday, the Committee on Oversight and Reform, the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., held a public hearing on the statehood petition of the District of Columbia. It's the first time Congress actually hosted hearings and heard uh, the District of Columbia's petition in 25 years. And both the constitutional and policy debate that ensued yesterday in Congress marks the beginning of an intense period of actually looking at statehood again and looking at the process that leads to statehood again. It's time for Puerto Rico to take stock. Moreover, this roundtable comes at a time when Puerto Rico is fending an impending Medicaid cliff. Uh, if by October 1st, the political branches in Washington DC neglect their moral responsibility towards the island's indigen population of close to 1.6 million Puerto Ricans who depend on Medicaid to fund their health necessities. I mean, we will be looking not only at the humanitarian crisis of inordinate proportions, but also at the potential financial implosion of the island's healthcare industry, which is basically the only industry that somehow is on the growth um, in Puerto Rico right now. And last but not least, this round table comes only three weeks ahead of the US Supreme Court's oral hearing, the oral argument in the Financial Oversight and Management Board v. Aurelius case, perhaps the most momentous case since Balzac the last of the so-called insular cases. So anyway, bearing in mind that the suggested framework for this roundtable is looking at the intersection between parity funding and the political status question in the interest of time, I will limit my initial remarks to the following observations. First, and contrary to what President Trump and his minions misleadingly suggest, <laughs> Puerto Rico is no welfare island. <laughs> Almost half of the states receive higher net federal expenditures per capita than Puerto Rico, where taxpayers in Puerto Rico do pay Social Security and Medicare taxes at the same rate as residents of the mainland, okay? Mm -hmm. And yet, the island is treated less favorably than the states in most federal expenditure programs, including Medicare. And the island is excluded altogether from other programs, such as, most importantly, the Earned Income Tax Credit Program. This notwithstanding, parity funding is no silver bullet. <coughs> Puerto Rico says fiscal and economic malaise will not be completely dissipated on the back of parity funding. And this is something I really want you guys to take away from this panel. Puerto Rico, in order to move forward, besides parity funding, needs the economic levers. Puerto Rico needs control over its commercial policy. Puerto Rico needs space to develop its own strategies, to interact with its neighbors, to export its goods, to basically move forward on the basis of economic variables that are controlled in Washington. So, so parity funding is about basically making sure those who have not are better off. But parity funding is not going to lead our economy into a new dimension that leads to self-sufficiency, okay? So that's one of the fundamental points I want to make today. Second, and I coincide both with Christina and a friend, if we were to look at the political status question in light of the parity funding issue, then the only option guaranteeing parity as a matter of constitutional right is statehood. Pursuant to the mandate flowing from the equal footing doctrine from the uniformity clause of the US Constitution, yet the obvious unviability of statehood 
if seen against the mirror of what's going on with the District of Columbia statehood petition renders unavailable this path for parity funding equality. In other words, in the abstract, obviously Puerto Rico could petition for statehood, but in practice, statehood for Puerto Rico is going nowhere, right? It's not an option, it's not in the cards. It's not a solution that will garner the necessary support in Congress to move forward at this stage. Thirdly, there is no explicit constitutional impediment precluding Congress from extending to Puerto Rico parity funding under the current status. Yet, Congress has shown itself considerably averse at this possibility obviously for political reasons. And moreover, the Supreme Court's much debated decision in Harris v. Rosario and Califano v. Torres affords Congress ample constitutional cover for denying the island equitable treatment. Fourthly, the issue of parity funding does not elude the sovereignty debate. It is well settled following the debacle of the tidings bill in 1936, that the path to sovereignty, <coughs> meaning either associ associated sovereignty or full sovereignty, is not devoid of the intricacies revolving around parity, because if you negotiate free association, or if you negotiate independence, you will surely must negotiate what's gonna happen with the funding that goes to welfare and to other social programs. Obviously, Puerto Rico will have to engage in a rather complex conversation with the political branches in Washington in terms of what's gonna happen with that type of support, right? Fifth, and I just want to put this whole, into, this whole issue into historical perspective. When Commonwealth status was established in 1952, the issue of parity funding was non-existent. Obviously, there wasn't the panoply of federal programs in America that we have today. The issue first came in 1959, when Muñoz Marin pushed for the first time to basically restructure and enhance Commonwealth status. So in 1959, the Muñoz administration basically filed the Fernos Murray bill uh, in the Congress to enhance Commonwealth. And at the time, the only parity funding issue that came forward was trying to basically equalize the social security benefits of folks living on the mainland with folks living in the island, right? Then in 1975, when the Hernandez Colon administration, when the first Hernandez Colon administration came to Washington during the Nixon years to negotiate the enhancement of the Commonwealth status, the parity funding issue was not discussed. And the recommendations that were rendered by the committee on status, folks who were appointed both by Nixon and Hernandez Colon, they did not, the report came out in October 1975, and nothing was mentioned about parity funding. Parity funding was not studied. I mean, the issue of parity funding was not looked at properly. The first time the parity funding issue was looked at in depth was in 1989, during the third attempt at having the status issue resolved. That, that's when the Bennett Johnston bill was introduced in the Senate. That's when uh, the definition of an enhanced commonwealth included a petition for both parity funding and the transfer to Puerto Rico block grant so Puerto Rico could have more leeway in terms of how it would distribute the funds that would, that would come into the island. Obviously now in 2019 after the long history of corruption uh, and debauchery and, and all sorts of uh, awful things happening with uh, federal funds, I mean it's, it's got obviously very hard to make this type of argument again in Washington. Uh, the sixth point I wanna make is that the model used by Washington in the Pacific Islands, the Marshall Islands, Palau, and the Federated States of the Micronesia, whereby 
Washington has assigned a limited uh, pool of resources. Obviously, those are small populations made up of folks who are not U.S. citizens. I mean, the, the demographics of the, of the Pacific Islands um, are much different than Puerto Rico says. But the model of the, of the former trust territories of the United Nations, I mean, that's not the only model Washington could actually pursue if it were to negotiate a sovereign arrangement with Puerto Rico. If we look, for instance, at what other sovereigns have done in terms of negotiating arrangements of self-sufficiency with special jurisdictions, as is the case of Denmark and Greenland, which actually in 2009 negotiated a new uh, self-government arrangement, or the case of Holland with its Caribbean uh, partners such as Curaçao and San Morton, which in 2010 negotiated a new arrangement of self-government, you're going to see that there are various models around the world. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Congress could state, uh, take stock of what others have done. The, in other words, there's no one size fits all in terms of what to do with this issue within the context of uh, parity funding. And uh, last but not least, I want to, as I conclude, emphasize the following. Getting full parity in all the federal programs available uh, made available by the federal government in of itself, uh, it's not going to assure self-sufficiency. Obviously, we need to reform PREPA. We need to become <coughs> energy independent. We need to address the Jones Act dilemma. We need to actually strengthen our manufacturing industry. We need to connect to the world. We need the levers. We need the strength of having a stronger economy. And parity funding, yes, it is important, but the diaspora as a community, I mean, as a, as a critical mass, should somehow realize that we should broaden our scope, right? And, and look at this, uh, not, not only within the lens of achieving equality in everything with the states, but in terms of what's best for us in the long term to achieve self-sufficiency. I mean, Puerto Rico is a very, in terms of geography, economy, demographics, uh, in terms of our outlook, I mean, Puerto Rico is rather unique in many ways. Mm -hmm. And you cannot expect to apply to Puerto Rico all the solutions you apply to Montana, Idaho, Nebraska, because Puerto Rico is something else. And therefore, we need, for Puerto Rico, we need solutions that really fit our own mold, okay? And that's the other takeaway I want you guys to basically um, get from this uh, discussion here. Thank you. So I would like to do two things before we end. Does any of the panelists want to respond to <laughs> <laughs> uh, expand? Question. Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah. uh, so let me just start taking hands. Uh, I'm gonna go one, two, let me start. One, two, three, four, and five. Uh, veo que una, dos, tres personas están en un panel para discutir el estatus de Puerto Rico y los tres están vendiendo la estadía. No, no, yo no, no estoy vendiendo la estadía. No, 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 el, el estratega de la estadidad para Puerto Rico desde el principio. Su tesis, Our Islands, uh, este, eh, la tesis es el, eh, de, la tesis doctoral de en Yale, y de hecho él era compañero de. Escribió de la ciudadanía porque escribió ahí. ¿Cómo? José Cabrán, el, la tesis de la ciudad es sobre la ciudadanía. ¿Eh? Sí. ¿No? O sea, el estadía como un derecho civil. ¿Ok? Por ahí vienen ustedes. No, no. Y los tres, no, no hay ni una persona representando 
al Estado Libre Asociado, imagina una persona representando, representando, están hablando de las necesidades. Déjeme explicarle algo. Un momento, un momento. Oiga, yo tengo oiga. un modelo, por ejemplo, el Estado de Israel. Pregunta, por favor. Hay otros modelos. Una pregunta. ¿Por qué no hacemos con el Estado de Israel? Ok, Primero que nada. Does everybody understand Spanish? No. Okay. Some people just didn't hear it either. Okay. Well, uh, so, so, let me get the second question. Well, I'm sorry. What was your question? What? Why can Puerto Rico not adopt Israel as a model? So, so no. okay. Professor Cox said there are other models out there. Okay. In addition to that. Okay. Let me get over here. I'm sorry. I would, I would, I would like to clarify something. Perhaps it's a difficulty of my, my either my uh, dominio del inglés or or the way that I presented the argument. I wasn't arguing for statehood, mm -hmm. and Cristina knows that, uh, <laughs> and Rafael also. Um, but let me let me say something about these types of panels. I'm a, I'm, I'm a university professor, and I try to present, I have my own preference, but when I am asked to talk about a topic, I try to, I try to present the different, different um, approaches to the problem, pointing out maybe a, um, advantages of some, alternatives or disadvantages, because I think that's my role as, as an academic. I, I do not advocate, usually I do not come to these panels to advocate for a specific uh, alternative. However, uh, and I felt compelled, since I teach law, to talk about what are, what are the legal possibilities within each of these alternatives for obtaining parity in funding. And it is my obligation to be intellectually honest about it. And because you know, I do not favor statehood, I respect very much the people who do. I do not favor statehood, but I can honestly say, I could not honestly say that state that in, in this particular issue, statehood is the only final guarantee in this particular issue of parity. I am not saying, I am not saying that statehood is the solution to our problem, uh, to, to the problem of Puerto Rico. In fact, I am for independence. If, if that's what you wanted me to say, <laughs> I, I usually, Okay, that's what I want. But I, I haven't made, I, I, I didn't come to advocate for any specific solution except for two things. Two things. One, one. I think the basic, the basic problem in Puerto Rico regarding the status question has to be reframed as an issue of self-determination. And that, and in that sense I might differ from some of the things that have been said, that that's one way to bring together people of different perspectives. Because if we, Puerto Ricans, in Puerto Rico and abroad, come together as one people to demand from Congress that the issue of colonial the colonial status of Puerto Rico be resolved, and that it be resolved because we have a right to self-determination. That could be a unifying issue, uh, approach, and that can lead, that can lead to whatever it will lead, but it will lead to whatever it will lead with the participation of everybody in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and not of uh, uh, special groups that have special uh, ideas, etc or the final solution. They, they, if, 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 Congress, if Congress ever decided to provide for a self-determination process, um, that day, that day, I, I am telling you honestly, that day I will vote for independence. But when I try 
to explain what are the alternatives. I have, as I said, to be intellectually <coughs> honest in terms of what the legal situation is. And that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. No, next question. <laughs> 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 A question for maybe a friend of, of uh, uh, Professor Ponce argues that uh, state of the heads, you know, basically put forward the uh, discourse of the monster movement that state of equality, blah, 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 blah. But state of is not the only form to get equality, right? No. Now, I agree with uh, Professor Alomar that state is not on the right. Probably will never get to uh, happen, right? So what will be your option? Given that stable is not an option, what will be your option to gain equality for a colonial people? Yeah, for uh, for her. For you too. I don't know. <laughs> <an answer. laughs> uh, you mentioned both free association, right? And of course, for Ricans might be distinct or peculiar in the sense that they're already citizens. But there's another major difference, and that is that the majority of people of Rican descent live now in the U.S. So. First of all, what role could Puerto Ricans in the U.S. play in getting to free association? And second, after free association, what would be the relationship between the diaspora and uh, the Puerto Rican nation? That's uh, so, uh, so before I answer the question directly, I want to say that I agree. So I, I too, am a university professor, and I've been on many, many panels in which I've done my best to uh, present the options, their pros and cons, in as balanced a way as I can. And the, I, I don't think I've ever been in an academic context and argued for statehood the way I did today. Um, Why is that? Uh, mm -hmm. Even Why though is I've that? been for statehood the whole way. Well, I haven't been for that because uh, my, I've seen my role as explaining. Right. You, uh, often I've been in places where not everybody fully understands it, there's a mix in the audience. So I want to lay out, here's this, here's this, here's this, here are the pros, here are the cons. I've always raised questions about the statusism between statehood and independence. I think that's, that's all, the only honest thing I can do in terms of the, whether they can be binding or you know, whether we would be at the mercy of Congress. That's just something I believe. But, but today I came in hard for statehood. Uh, and you know, I, I don't know, maybe it's just it's, it's, it's that in this moment and with, with the things that have happened in the last few years, I think I feel a certain, you know, with, I feel like what I said at the beginning, which is that this conversation to me feels like fine-tuning subordination at a certain point. Uh, so, and that's with all respect, there's other options. I just, you know, have my views on the ones that we have and uh, feel like it's, a, I, I feel more strongly that I need to start advocating for statehood or maybe, you know, so, uh, in certain occasions that I might otherwise have left my view more behind the scenes. So, I didn't want to say so much about that. I just want to say, I also, I wholeheartedly agree with the argument that that a self-determination framing is the appropriate framing. That is the way this has to be. And in fact, I spent years working with an organization that was all about, it's not the options, it's self-determination. People having a voice, being clear about what the options and consequences are, and moving forward that way. And I still believe that. People have to have their choice. That said, so to try to answer your question, this is going to connect to the answer to your question. You say statehood's not going to happen, and so what are the other options? So a lot of what I say sounds like what statehood say all the time, probably because I just agree. And <laughs> I think that a lot of these arguments make sense. So to me to say, you know, statehood isn't coming, you know, it's like going back to the civil rights era, blacks saying voting rights aren't coming. So what do we do instead? Forget it. No, 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 no. Voting rights are coming. We have to demand them. Okay? Okay. That said, there are other arrangements. Statehood isn't the only thing in the world, for sure. Independence, I don't have a problem with independence. If the day comes and I get to vote, which I won't because I'm living here, I don't think they're gonna let us vote and that's fine with me. Um, but if I did have the opportunity to vote, I would vote for statehood for sure. But if Puerto Rico voted for, if a majority voted for independence, I would celebrate just the same. That's another option. So for me, my thinking, so I don't wanna keep making the state case for state over and over and I wanna leave time for other things. But just quickly, it's not just equality, it's empowerment. Okay, so there are different forms of empowerment, but I think, okay, there's other models in the world, for sure, no doubt, but there is a, we're, we're in a situation, we're in a context, we're in a reality. We are the, the, the power, the global power that most affects our 
fate, whether or not we are formally tied to it, is the United States. And in my view, the, the best way for Puerto Rico to achieve economic progress and empowerment is to have leverage in the halls of Congress. To be able to come in and I have a voice and no one's gonna do anything to me because I'm an exception. Okay, so uh, short of statehood, other forms of equality, I, I, I um, so you know, for me, independence would be the other one. The, the in-between is not free associated statehood, in my view, is independence with a treaty. That treaty could be modified. It, that treaty could be abrogated. In fact, under free associated statehood, we could be US citizens, but they could also decide that we won't be. Going forward, they can't take it from anybody who already has it, but going forward, they might say enough. They might make us US nationals, and when the Filipinos, who were US nationals, were put on the path to independence, for 10 years, immigration restrictions were imposed on them, even as US nationals. So, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty there, too, as, as I agree with that, there's uncertainty in all directions, statehood included, what's gonna happen to Obamacare, what's happening in this country altogether, I don't disagree with that, but, <laughs> but I think that the, the leverage and, and the kind of empowerment that one gets with the form of equality that's involved with statehood is the best, and if not that, well, I hope for independence, and, you know, in, in between free associated statehood is independence anyway, the, the in-between stuff is, is, is colonialism, in my view. Okay, that was too long, I'm sorry. Let me, let me, let me, let me, yeah, I think I need, yeah, let's put this, I want, I want, let's put this whole thing into perspective a little bit, okay? Uh, first of all, I, I will have to take to task the, the syllogism of the civil rights movement uh, syllogism, okay? Obviously, black folks in America, my dear friends, have no other choice Obviously, the choice was clear. Seeking the promised land, and the promised land was only one promised land, equality in this land, my friends. The people of Puerto Rico, there is a multitude of contending opinions, and we have had contending opinions since the times of Spain. Some folks, like Valdoriotti de Castro, wanted autonomy in light of the Canadian model. Other people, like Jose Julian Blanco, Celia Aguilera, Acosta y Calvo and others, they wanted some sort of administrative autonomy with Spain. And then when the United States came around, Barbosa advocated for statehood, and Muñoz Rivera came out with this self-government type arrangement, and the rest is history. In Puerto Rico, I think, the worst that could happen is, and the most atrocious sin that anybody can commit against the people of Puerto Rico is to distort the will of the people of Puerto Rico because there are almost 50% of the Puerto Rican people who are against statehood. What the heck do you propose doing with those folks? Are you going to silence them as, as they were silenced in the negotiations going to the Paris Treaty in 1898? It was only the Spaniards and the Americans negotiating, the Cubans, the Filipinos, and the Puerto Ricans who were nowhere around. And if, you're gonna need, and if you're going to basically legitimize a process, and that's my problem with this panel, by the way, and, 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 I, you know, and, I, and, I, and I want to be on tape, basically, because if you, if you premise this conversation on the basis of parity, the only logical outcome is statehood. That's precisely why this gentleman came up with that comment, right? But this should be premised on the basis of Puerto Rico's right to self-determination. Mm -hmm. And if you start, there will be no self-determination, no freely self-determination under international law if you start manipulating folks with welfare, snap, this and the other. And the other thing I want to say is, when people start speculating because it's pure speculation my friends no one knows for sure what the united states is willing to give or negotiate with us with respect to independence free association enhanced commonwealth or statehood because we have no legal framework there is no procedural framework right now and the only procedural framework i believe is suitable is the status assembly Asamblea Constituyente. You have folks from Puerto Rico and the U.S. negotiating definitions, substantive definitions, in detail. And then the people of Puerto Rico can make a choice. 
but I cannot speculate. What I think the diaspora and, and the centro perhaps should do is, first of all, help folks in Puerto Rico try and come up with this procedural framework, try and actually create a critical mass amongst the diaspora that this is a self-determination issue. This is not an individual civil, civil rights issue, because otherwise you fall into the trap of silencing half of the Puerto Rican people who are not necessarily in favor of statehood. You are, you are basically stacking the deck in favor of statehood before the whole thing starts. I mean, I think, and, and I think that's just not the proper way of doing this, right? Right. I have one hand over here. Two. I, have, I had one hand over here. Uh -huh. One hand over here. Two, three. Four. Yes. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. Uh, can the panel dig further into those two legal cases you discussed earlier? I believe uh, it was Vallejo and Ramirez. You were talking about these cases that were are they now presently being argued in the federal court system? And secondly, the issue of diaspora and its political power in influencing Congress. I referred to an article that the New Yorker just did recently on Hispanics in Florida and talked about Cuban American power, Colombian power, Venezuelan power, and Nicaraguan power in terms of uh, is, uh, having a, uh, a sort of a, a breaking function on both the Democratic and Republican candidates running for president. And I'm wondering if you could, you know, the gentleman just talked about the issue of self determination of public opinion. How do you critically assess in the diaspora right now in America the political power of Puerto Ricans in terms of, issu of, of, of issuing and uh, influencing these kind of issues you're talking about in practical ways, politically, particularly, let's say, this presidential election, because it doesn't seem that Puerto Rico is on the radar screen of these presidential <coughs> candidates. That's and, I'm just wondering what you, what you okay. take. Well, in terms of the cases, <coughs> one case has to do with my aerial case, has to do with a person who was living in New York, <coughs> receiving SSI benefits in New York, moved to Puerto Rico. He didn't notify the um, Social Security Administration that he had uh, moved, but he kept receiving the, uh, the benefits. Um, well, this is according to the statement of facts in the, in the opinion. Um, and after several months, uh, Social Security Administration um, became aware that he had moved to Puerto Rico and tried to recover the money that um, to the administration had sent to this person while living in Puerto Rico because SSI doesn't apply in Puerto Rico. Residents of Puerto Rico are not eligible for SSI benefits. Now, let me, let me inject at this point uh, that it is wrong to say that Puerto Ricans are not eligible. Puerto Ricans living in the U.S. are eligible. <coughs> Texans who move to Puerto Rico and live there are not eligible <laughs> for SSI benefits. So it's the residents of Puerto Rico who are not eligible for SSI benefits. Um, so uh, they tried to uh, recover the money, and he sued the government, and alleging that uh, the, uh, the non-application of SSI benefits to residents of Puerto Rico was unconstitutional. Now that, of course, the government opposed um, uh, <coughs> the, uh, that claim, and eventually uh, the district judge, actually the chief judge in the federal court in Puerto Rico de decided for the plaintiff uh, and basically agreeing that this exclusion was unconstitutional. So that's, that's in a nutshell what the case is about. Now the case is on appeal uh, in the circuit court. The other case is still pending, it's in a very preliminary stage uh, and it, this is ten people, uh, well it's now nine because one, one of the plaintiffs died recently. Um, ten people who live in Puerto Rico who are in different types of situations um, who 
claim that they are that they should be considered eligible to receive SSI benefits, and also that they uh, should be able to receive the benefits that are part of the Medicare Part D program, which is a supplemental subsidy for low-income people that does not apply in Puerto Rico. And also, um, some of them are, are alleging that uh, they, are, um, they are hurt by the cap placed on the nutrition assistance program, which is called SNAP in the U.S., but PAN uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, and um, the, the, those who qualify for the PAN program in Puerto Rico do receive a lesser amount of benefits than the people who receive the SNAP benefits in the state. So they are also challenging that um, the form of discrimination. And that is, as I said, in the uh, U.S. District Court. Now, the government, of, again, the U.S. government, uh, replied um, opposing the, uh, uh, the, the allegations and, uh, and asked, and this is interesting because the government uh, moved to have the case dismissed. Uh, it is possible to move to have a case dismissed in an early stage. Uh, alleging precisely that one of the things they did, they said was that um, these two U.S. Supreme Court, Supreme Court cases from 40 years ago uh, <coughs> uh, were the precedents that had to be applied, and, and they controlled the case, and they controlled the uh, that was the law that Congress could discriminate. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the um, the judge designated to see that case is not one of the Puerto Rico court judges. He's a judge from Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and he's seen that case. And um, he's a conservative, Republican appointee, mm -hmm. if that's any indication of anything, but it, it, it doesn't have to be an, indica an indication of anything because the judge the, after oral argument for the motion to dismiss, uh, denied the motion to dismiss and said that there are grounds to go ahead with this case. And he he's sort of you know, sort of sounded very sympathetic with the with the claims made by the plaintiffs. So that's an interesting development. Uh, so, uh, so that's basically you know, what the two cases are about. Uh, the other question was, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I talk too much and I forget what I'm well, saying. Okay. Well, I'm surprised. Can you ask one question? Can you ask one other question? I have two last questions because we're out of time. Okay. Our colleague here, Carlos Vargas, is it close? Uh, my question will be to this young girl. Sometimes you get yelled at <laughs> okay, my question is to the uh, professor. Uh, professor, professor, what's your name? Professor, professor Ponsa. Ponsa. Professor Ponsa. About the issue of statehood. Uh, what would happen to those who identify themselves as indigenous Native Americans in Puerto Rico? Because a good portion of us are of indigenous blood. Are we going to have a reservation for us? A prior <laughs> section? <laughs> you all kept using the word sovereign. The nations here are a sovereign people. <laughs> so, I don't actually know what would happen. The, na the, the nations here have a range of statuses, none of which I find particularly enviable. It's a, that problem, I have thought at times, is amazingly, it seems even more intractable than ours. So, uh, that's just my honest answer. I, there's just a range of, <coughs> of, of, of situations that, that Native peoples are in, and I don't know what would happen in Puerto Rico. Probably nothing great. Yeah. No, I just want to comment that there are two notions of equality. One, equality within the U.S. Uh, Union, and equality within the community of nations. And some people in Puerto Rico believe on the first type of equality, and other people believe that we should be equal in terms of equality with the rest of the world, including the U.S. So those, those you know, 
I might have thought we were talking about that. Yeah. Let me leave one last question with Carlos Vargas. Yes, yes uh, uh, thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for a well-informed and, and, and very insightful uh, uh, commentary and panel uh, mm -hmm. uh, presentations. Uh, the reasons why we put, we thought about putting the panel together was among other things to deal with the crisis in Puerto Rico. Right? So the question on parity is one of the issues that is being debated in Congress right now. So this is why we wanted to understand, because it appears to be clear that with statehood, the option of parity of funding is evident. It is not so clear with the other options as you, uh, with, uh, Professor Alomar, uh, explained. And that is what we need to explore. We need to explore what are the possibilities of funding parity or lack of parity whether it is less or more funding uh, for Puerto Rico in the different status options. Uh, but in that context, then I'll, I'll post a question, and I'll just lay because I don't think we'll have time to answer it, which is, what is the likelihood that the question of uh, funding parity be addressed in relation to the status question of Puerto Rico? <coughs> Meaning, it is not likely that we are going to resolve the status issue anytime soon. Whereas the question of whether parity may be resolved may become ahead of the of resolving the issue of status. That depends on the political will of the Congress. I mean, that's just beyond our hands, right. and that's the thing with this whole issue. I mean, it's just beyond our control. It depends on what happens depends on in the Congress, and right now, in the midst of a presidential campaign with the Senate in Republican hands and the White House, God knows in whose hands. <laughs> It's impossible, really, to know what's going to happen with that issue. I mean, what do you guys think? Okay. I mean, maybe the cases will lead to something. Okay. I mean, who knows? Unless, un unless <coughs> the Supreme Court eventually decides that equality, I mean, that parity is a, is a matter of right. Yeah. Uh, of right that, that, that yeah. residents of Puerto Rico and of the other territories have a right, a constitutional right to have equal access to those benefits. If that happens, so. Uh, well then, that would be one way to solve it. Within the current territorial relationship, here again, but we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. And, and I would ask the Supreme question: what, what are the odds that the Supreme Court would decide that compared to the odds that Congress would decide to make Puerto Rico a state? We don't know. I mean, this is all. <laughs> The magic ball. The magic ball. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs>